Hey, thanks for joining us again on another episode of Let's Get Real. My name is Morgan Butcher, I'm one of the hosts of Let's Get Real, and every week we're uh, sitting down with uh, public figures, pastors, leaders in our community uh, who have roots here, and uh, hearing a little bit more about their story, their faith, and, and just kind of life for them. And today we have a really special guest uh, joining us. Uh, former UW men's basketball coach and current Pepperdine University basketball coach, Lorenzo Romar. Lorenzo is uh, an incredible man, man of faith, and uh, was an incredible coach at the University of Washington uh, before transitioning and now coaching at Pepperdine University. We're thankful to have him today on Let's Get Real, so let's get started. Again, thanks so much for. Is it okay if I call you coach? <laughs> Whatever you want, doesn't matter. Uh, appreciate your time today and, and just making an opportunity to, to hang out and chat a little bit. Um, for those of, of our viewers that are kind of tuning in uh, that might not know you as well, uh, could you just share a little bit about yourself, um, about your, uh, about kind of your upbringing and, and how faith has really come such a, a part of your life? Well, we, we grew up in a, uh, a family where uh, church was not demanded, but, uh, you know, God was mentioned every now and then. I can remember my father uh, getting on his knees, praying before he went to bed mm -hmm. sometimes. And uh, we were kind of, the situation was Christmas and Easter, we went to church for sure. Okay, that was me too. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. We were we were we were that family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but nothing was ever forced on us. Uh, never scriptures weren't read. I knew my parents had a belief in God, but it wasn't talked about yeah. uh, a whole lot. And I grew up thinking that I don't know, maybe it had to, something to do with sports, loving sports. Is that I had to do good things, and the more good things I did, the more points I would score with God. Mm and just try to be a good person. Mm -hmm. And in comparison to others, uh, especially where I grew up in Compton, you know, I may have, I did okay that way, I think, but when you look at God's standard, I was falling way short. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was 20, 24, I think it was, uh, 23, I started to, get more interested. And I remember going to the head of the church where we were and asking certain questions about the church because I was mm -hmm. challenged about, you know, was I really, uh, did I really have a relationship with the Lord? Mm -hmm. And I thought if I was going to church and doing what I was supposed to do, yeah, I did. But mm -hmm. I realized I didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read the Bible for the first time. And uh, September 10th, 1983 is where my wife and I both gave our lives to Christ wow. and, and realized that uh, just being a good person didn't get you close mm. to, to having a relationship with the Lord here on earth as well as spending eternity with him when we would leave this earth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's how, that's how I, I became a Christian. Wow. That's, that's awesome. And coach, you can preach. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <You're a> preacher. <laughs> Just uh, so, telling a story. <laughs> so you you really grew up ingrained in sports. I went to UW for played played ball there, and then uh, drafted by the Warriors. Was it? I was. Yes. Yeah. So uh, did you grow up playing basketball? It was basketball second sport, second choice, or was it was it right there at the top the whole time? You know, we kind of grew up playing them all, but my favorites were baseball and basketball. Really? Okay. And um, baseball, I loved baseball. You know, I was a sports addict, as you, you mentioned in a different way. But yeah. growing up in Compton, you know, it was the Dodgers, it was the Lakers, it was USC for football and UCLA for basketball. Yeah. And that was during the time when John Wooden was there right. and uh, uh, John Robinson and Pat McKay, I think it was mm. John McKay, John McKay were at USC and the Dodgers were winning world championships and it was just a great, great time. And I would listen to those sports on the radio. Uh, I would listen, I would watch everything I could. Back then, you know, there was a, 
something called the TV guy. And <laughs> whenever my mother would go to, to work, I'm sorry, to get groceries, yeah. uh, at the end of the week, she'd come back and the first thing we wanted to look for to see was what sweets she bought and where was the TV guy? <laughs> Because we had to go look at the sports and special section to Absolutely. find out what sports were going to be on television. <laughs> and uh, that we couldn't wait to do that. And we would plan our week based on what was coming on television with sports. Oh, and <clears throat> that's how that's how we were we were into it. I mean, I, I had a, a scorebook that I, I got that uh, I would literally keep score of the Dodger baseball games. I'd listen on the oh, radio yeah. and then someone would get a hit. I'd mark it on there in a little space, that whole thing. Yeah. But uh, basketball won out, and I played baseball through high school and then just stuck with basketball. But I remember going to baseball practice but bringing my basketball with me. Mm. So before practice started and when it ended, I, I would play basketball. So just mm. sports addict and yeah. just was obsessed, obsessed yeah. with the game of basketball. So growing up uh... – who was who was who were the basketball players that you most you know wanted to to play like? Elgin Baylor mm. was the guy who went to Seattle University. Yeah, uh, he was the guy that just was phenomenal. Him and Jerry West, and then you you know Earl Monroe, Earl the Pearl. Oh. But uh, the the guy that and you know I eventually got to meet him was Bill Russell. Oh wow! Because. It just seemed like the Lakers played them every year in the championship and <laughs> had a tough time beating them. And uh, he was just he was just larger than life to me because mm. he was so – he just kept winning. And, you know, he had the goatee and he was 6'9", and he controlled the game. And he was the only guy that could give Wilt Chamberlain, yeah. who was a Goliath at the time, a, a good go at it. Yeah. You know, the Lakers played at the fabulous forum in Inglewood, California. And when I was with my parents, we would drive past there going somewhere. And I remember stop, you know, the light, just the light would catch us, the traffic light, mm. the lights red. And I'm just staring at this form. It's right there mm. and on the, on the big billboard at January 26, Boston, huh. that meant they were coming to town and huh. just, what would it be like to be in that place? And, uh, those guys, I mean, there, there were so many players uh, around that time that you just looked up to. I kept basketball cards, collected them, and just knew almost every player in that league, if you mentioned their name. So there were a lot of players to look up to. Oh, I love it. Now, you mentioned Coach Wooden, um, who was probably a big role model for you, obviously, growing up in that area, and just as a coach now, I'm sure, even. Uh, and I believe it was – was it uh, 2006 that you won the Coach Wooden uh, Keys to Life Award? Correct. Yes, it was. Uh huh. What did it What did it mean to you? You know, growing up in that area, knowing about Coach Wooden, and then you know later in life being a coach, winning that award. What What did that feel like for you? Well, it would have felt. It would have been very special. Uh, just you know, having won that award, but. When I was an assistant at UCLA, I got to spend hours with Coach Wood. Mm -hmm. And to know what he stood for and to know his values, it took on even more significance for me. Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, it's one of those very humbling uh, uh, situations where someone recognizes something that you did. And mm -hmm. uh, it was, man, it was, it was special. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Coach Wooden was right there and handed it to me. And it was it was pretty special. That's great. Now, when I was uh, – I, I have to say this. Yeah. When I was uh, in junior college, Cerritos Community College in Southern California, I was being recruited, and one of the schools was University of Washington. Mm. And uh, I took a visit, an official recruiting visit to Washington. And when I was leaving, I was on the plane. I was all I could think about in a two and a half hour drive back was, okay, here are your schools. Which one do you want? And I just felt like Washington after coming from Washington was the one mm. that I wanted to attend, but I wasn't 100% sure, but I was certainly leaning that way. And I get off the plane and, you know, I'm walking from the gate to the front 
And as I'm walking uh, up ahead of me, and there's this long hallway at uh, LAX. And I, up ahead of me, I said, you know what? I recognize that guy up there. And I bet you he could give me some sound advice uh, on what school I should go to. And it was it was John Wood. Oh, wow. So at the time, I had never met him. So I, I, I start jogging toward him. And I finally <laughs> catch him. He's alone. He's by himself. Yeah. And I just said, Coach, you don't know who I am. And I introduced myself. I said, I will, can I ask you a question? And I told him the schools that I had a chance to, to go to. And he said, listen, if you have a chance to play for Mark Harshman, hmm. he's one of the most respected co- – I respect him as much as any coach in the NCAA. Hmm. If you have a chance to play there, I would imagine it would be hard for you to turn that down. And I went to the University of Washington. Oh, and that was my first time meeting John Wood. Oh, that's such a great story. What a, what a small little world that you ran into him at the airport right after that visit. That's, that's too funny. How about that? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, coach, one of the things that, you know, just, I'm, I'm a huge UW fan, you know, uh, I, I graduated high school right about the same time that you started coaching at UW and, you know, yes. so, so just so enjoyed watching, uh, you know, you coach and those guys play uh, for so many years there. But one of the things that, you know, even beyond, you know, you know, most people will recognize you for, you know, being the former coach of the UW men's basketball team around here, uh, you know, connected to the program for what, like 17 years between playing and coaching? Um, yes. Yeah. But, you know, you, you've really had an incredible impact just in this area, even still today, uh, you know, aside from being the coach of, of the men's basketball team, but just really using your platform as an opportunity to share your faith uh, with so many in the area, school assemblies, church gatherings, community events uh, throughout the years. Um, when you get the opportunity like that to share with young people, whether, you know, up here or in California or wherever you are, uh, when you get the opportunity to share uh, something with young people, old people about, uh, you know, your faith and what God has done in your life, what, what's the thing that you really want to make sure that you communicate to people? Uh, that uh, I'm here for a reason, and that is to whatever success that I've experienced, it was great. It's been great for myself, my family, but God put me in this position to, to tell others about him mm-hmm. and how great he is. And, um, if, if I don't do that, it's, you know, I, I feel like I'm burying mm-hmm. the, the gift that God gave me and the responsibility that he gave me and called me to do it. I was with Athletes in Action for seven years. Mm. And Athletes in Action is the uh, sports branch of Campus Crusade for Christ. And oh, okay. we we uh, we use the game of basketball as a platform to talk to the, to the country and to the world mm. about Jesus Christ. And so many people admire sports and pay attention to sports. And that's what we use. We use that to to tell people uh, about the goodness of Christ. And uh, I learned a lot on how to share my faith. And when I left Athletes in Action to join uh, UCLA staff, men's basketball staff as an assistant, I I made a vow to the Lord that I would always keep a ministry mindset, even though I wasn't in ministry full time in terms of being employed. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I would be in ministry full time. So whenever I, I have an opportunity to do that i try to take advantage of it and and again uh this that's why i responded to you because there was an opportunity to talk about the lord man well we really appreciate it no doubt now i I, you know i'm just kind of curious how has your faith you know influenced your coaching and and your coaching style you know has there how how is what's that crossover like between you know, coaching up these young men uh, who come from all different backgrounds and, and the way that, you know, you kind of operate in life and, and your faith, how has your faith influenced your coaching? I think it has, uh, it's, it's given me some consistency. It's, it's given me a, a feel of integrity uh, amongst those that we work with. Mm. Uh, they, I think that it's helped with trust in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And it's because if if you live, try to live your life the way God wants you to live it, I think uh, 
there may be some that persecute you. There may be some that write you off or mm. don't want to be around it. But I think by and large, it's an attractive lifestyle because mm. ultimately yeah. we were all created to have a relationship with, with God through Jesus yeah. Christ, even though many don't take the Lord up on it. <laughs> yeah. So we are at peace and at our best when we have a relationship with the Lord. And I think that if we're living that in front of people, they see that, and I think it's it's attractive. It's our life is supposed to be salt and create a thirst, and I think people see that. And even in the times when I've made mistakes and I've done things that weren't Christian like, and others have seen it and and observed it, to be able to say I blew that and I was totally wrong, mm. I think even that speaks volumes. I think sometimes as Christians mm. we believe that. We have to live this perfect life in front of people. I, I think if you do that, it makes it seem like uh, it's unattainable. But to see people see that you make mistakes also and that you have flaws in your life, uh, I think that uh, makes it even more attractive. Not that they relish in your mistakes, but they say, you know what, this is not bad. I, I could do this too. And Make the makes Christian life maybe even more appealing. I, I think when Christians stumble, make mistakes, but try to uh, pass it off as "don't judge me," that mm. type of thing, I, I don't. I don't think that goes over over really well. But mm, yeah. uh, situation, being able to be here and, and, and share my faith has, I think, just helped. I think it helps in recruiting. Because we, we try to be truthful with those that we recruit. Sure, yeah. I, I think that uh, in dealing with our players every day, we treat them like they would want to be treated in terms of respect. Mm -hmm. We get on them. We get on their case. You got to make decisions. You got to discipline them. But at the same time, we do it in a, try to do it in a respectful manner, mm -hmm. and they know what to expect. I think young people deep down would like to have structure they just want it to be consistent and know what it is sure. and when that. you're able to provide that for them and establish that for them and you stick with it i think they learn from it and uh kids even come back after they played for us and says i i use some of the same principles coach that you use with us with my kids and with my team mm. oh, that's great that's really good now, um, you know, I, uh, I, I can really relate with your coaching background because, uh, you know, I, I coached uh, sixth and seventh grade basketball for two years, about five years uh -huh. ago. So, you know, I really got some deep roots in the coaching game. Uh, hey, coaching is coaching. <laughs> coaching is coaching. You still got to make them do, do the right thing, right? That's right. That's right. We, uh, we, we are also uh, well-versed in heartbreak in basketball. We, uh, we lost the uh, championship game one year. And, uh, you know, I think, I think heartbreak is something that everyone can relate with, whether it's on the basketball court or in life. And, uh, you know, I, I know that in coaching, you've really got to be okay with losing. And, um, <laughs> you, you know, that's just kind of the reality of it. Um, how do you, you, you know, I, I know that we probably have no idea the strain that that coaching puts on a person and the, the pressure that that you have to um you know perform and and to to you know raise these guys up and to train them and then you know to have moments where you know you come up short um i think everyone can relate with that how do you how do you handle those moments of heartbreak or of of you know failure or loss um in, in coaching and in life really? It's extremely difficult. Uh, there's nothing like, you know, I don't like losing in, in checkers, you know, uh, but, but there's nothing like working hard to recruit kids for one common goal. Mm -hmm. You go out, you practice, you, you work your tail off, you go out and now you compete against someone else and you come up short. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, it just, it, it's hard to get to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, you watch the film over and over and over. What could I have done better? And at times you beat yourself up. Uh, it's just, those are the ups and downs. And it's just, uh, you go through situations and I've been through them, had teams at UW where we didn't have winning seasons and it's a long season. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really hard. Yeah. But what, what my faith has allowed me to do is still keep it in perspective after the time that you grieve, you're 
it's it's a down. It's not fun. Uh, when you're coaching, you're judged on one thing: did you win? Right. And uh, that's what your judge doing. And to keep it in perspective, when it's all said and done, why am I doing this? Am I doing this with everything that I have? Am I giving it my all? If I'm giving it my all, and I know my purpose, then when the dust settles, I'm able to move on and go on with with great energy. But uh, to say when the game's over, oh, that's okay, God's in control. No, I don't feel like that. I feel like mm-hmm. this is this is messed up. <laughs> How come we didn't win that game? Yeah, yeah. But but it always uh, it always comes back to what is my perspective. Mm, that's that's great. That's great. Well, and I think you know that's that's such an important realization because, like we talked about, like, every, everyone will experience that in some way or some form. You know. Um, but to to be able to you're right mourn and then step back and and reflect and keep it in perspective i think is great great advice but 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 you know what it's uh the the flip side of that the other side i think it's very difficult to handle success i think that Mm. when you have those moments where you fall short and it appears that you might be failing there's something within most of us that you you get up you you survive you Mm. find a way to survive Winning success sometimes breeds contentment and mm. and and arrogance. Yeah, and you have to the same way that I have to keep it in perspective when things are going well. I actually have to keep it in perspective when things are going well, yeah. knowing that God has given me the ability to do this, and it's I, I'm not going to say God won the game. I'm not saying that at all. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying he gave me the ability to do this, and I need to make sure that I understand why I'm doing this, yeah. just like before, yeah. and keep that in perspective as well. So I, I've got to ask, just as a, a, a longtime UW guy, loved watching, loved watching the boys play, uh, what is your greatest coaching memory from UW? I, I can tell you mine right now, but I'm, I'm really interested in yours. Let me hear yours. Let's see if I agree with it. Okay. I'll tell you what, man, nothing. Well, okay. There, there's probably, there's, there's definitely a couple, but for me ingrained in my head is that step back Isaiah Thomas jumper to beat Arizona. That will be <laughs> forever ingrained in my memory, jumping off the couch, doing some backflips. I didn't do backflips, yeah. but I did something. <laughs> that is definitely up there. That, wow. That one was really special. Uh, Another one would be when we were playing against Washington State in the 2008-2009 season. Mm. And if we won the game at home, we would have clinched the Pac-10 title for the first time in 53 years. And to win that game and to watch everyone rush the floor, Mm. uh, you know, it was against Washington State. Right, yeah. (laughs) So it was, that was a great moment also. Uh, I think of the time when we were uh, in our second year, and we had lost our first five league games. We were 0-5 and, and then won our last 12 out of 13. And the, the last conference game we won, we played against Stanford. And they were number one in the country, and they were undefeated. Right. They hadn't lost yeah. in league. I don't think anyone had gone 18-0 and 0 and been undefeated in the Pac-10. And all they had to do was beat us. And the game was sold out. We won the game. And again, the students rushed the floor. That was a great day that day. But uh, I, I would have to say we, the next year in 2005, we had a, we had a really good season and we had a selection Sunday party and everyone showed up in uh, the heck at Alaska airlines arena. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they put the actual selection Sunday was up there on the big screen. Mm. And right before, right before it came on, uh, CBS wanted to talk to me and they were putting on the selection Sunday and they asked me, where did I think we should be seated? And I said, uh, no worse than a third seed, but I think, we should be a second seed. And uh, of course they already knew where we were going to be seated. And I went back down and sat with our team and they announced we were the number one seed Mm -hmm. in the NCAA tournament. And it there was a lot of pride at that point, good pride Mm -hmm. and a a real sense of 
accomplishment that we were able to get there and get to that level. That day, that day was pretty special. Oh, man. Being surrounded by all those players too would be just so fun to celebrate with them. Yes, absolutely, oh, man, absolutely. So, uh, are there a couple? Are there a couple players you coached that you know just immediately just stood out from the rest when you when you watched them play? I mean, just just any any players off the top of your head that you've coached over the years that you know just just had it. Oh my goodness, there were. <laughs> You had a few. There were a number of those. <laughs> there were a number lot. of those that, you know, when we, we first saw them, uh, you just thought, wow, if, if we can get him, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to make us pretty good. <laughs> so, I mean, we go on. It's hard to just pick one on sure. that one. And, and, and I'm not trying to use diplomacy there either. No, I uh, don't totally understand. It just, it's just there were a number of them that when we saw them play for the first time, they were they were pretty special, you know. It's hard not to be mesmerized when you watch Nate Robinson's freakish athletic ability, yeah. the things that he did with his with his size, mm. you know. But uh, by and large, there were a lot of players that the first time I saw them, uh, uh, I was just giddy, mm. anticipating if we were able to get them to come to the University of Washington. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one of my one of my favorites to watch. He, you know, there was there was a big smooth a long time ago by the name of Sam Perkins, but I would I would refer to him as the little smooth. Uh, I've never watched somebody play as smooth as Brandon Roy before. <laughs> wow, that guy. He, he certainly was. Uh, he was accused. We had another guy that wasn't quite Brandon's level. Now he didn't stay four years either, but. Terrence Ross was smooth, and yeah. you know people accused both of those guys of not playing hard. Really, and but they were so smooth it yeah. looked like they weren't really trying. But yeah. if you were out there on the floor going against them, you'd have changed your mind. <laughs> he better be trying, otherwise I just look real bad right now. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. Well, Coach, uh, can I hit you? We, we, we like to end every one of these segments with some rapid-fire questions just to get to know you really okay, well. excuse me. Oh, yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, all right. These are just kind of off-the-wall, random questions. You just answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Is that fair? Okay, all right. All, all right. right, cool. Here we go. If you could own any animal as a pet, what would it be? German Shepherd. Oh, okay, I like it. Celebrity you would most want to sit down with for lunch? Other than, than Christ and Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. uh, after those two uh, celebrity right now, I don't know. Rapid fire is getting me. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not being able to answer these. Hey, we'll up. take we'll take Christ and Martin Luther, man. Those are good answers right there. I, I should have opened it up. All right, okay. snack that is currently in your pantry that you want to eat. Uh, Chunky Monkey ice cream that's oh. in the freezer, Ben wow. and Jerry's. But uh, it would it would be pop secret popcorn. My wife is resonating with that Chunky Monkey reference, man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Some People don't know about it. People don't know about it. It's dangerous. If you could binge watch any TV show, what would you choose for the rest of your life? TV show? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Sanford and Son would be up there. Oh, okay. Okay. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Song that will get you on the dance floor. <laughs> That's just, it's just there, there's too many. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, I can't answer that. There are too many. Can't even get them. Would you get on the dance floor for some Earth, Wind, and Fire? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire to me was better to listen to than to dance to, though. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I appreciate yeah. some Earth, Wind, and Fire as well. All yeah. right. Uh, any nicknames you had growing up? Doc and Low were the two. Doc and Low, I like it. Sunrises or sunsets? Sunrises, without question. Mm. Favorite place to travel? Favorite place to travel would be uh, probably uh, Hawaii. Oh, yeah. Thing you are most thankful for? It would be Christ dying for me and my family. Coach, thank you so much for your time. Honestly, genuinely appreciate it and honored to spend some time talking to you today. 
Thanks so much for having me. It's good to get to a chance to say hello and get to meet you over the phone. Absolutely. We'll be cheering for you down at Pepperdine, and uh, God bless you. Okay, same to you. All right.